Uh, I'm Aurélie Dubois, General Delegate of Respect Ocean, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you and be with you today for the third and last webinar of our second dedicated to blue carbon. The first one uh, took place in March in French, and the second one was organized in May in English. Today is the third and last one. We are delighted to organize this cycle in partnership with Climate Champions, and I would like to thank Ineas, who organized this cycle in 222 with us. We will also have two question and answer sessions. So I invite you to write your questions in the chat box during all the presentations, and in English, please, if you can. Uh, like our other webinars, we will also have some live sketching with said Fanny Didou. Before we start the presentations today, I, I would just like to let Ignace remind us what was discussed in the last sessions and what is the topic today. So Ignace, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Aurélie, and hello, everyone. Good to, to be here uh, again for this last um, webinar to conclude the um, exciting and busy year, I believe, for <laughs> um, uh, most of you. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, the, the topic of, of Blue Carbon, the objective of the three uh, sessions and that are concluding today is, was really to give you an overview um, on, on why blue carbon are, are relevant uh, in terms of uh, scientific, uh, from a scientific perspective, uh, and why are they relevant to build the resilience of coastal communities to sequester carbon. So we had the first session with uh, Laurent Bob at the CNRS to, to provide us with, with this uh, very clear um, uh, uh, overview on why blue carbon are currently on top of the mind on the global, uh, regional, and, and local agendas um, for uh, coastal um, um, uh, states. Um, so that was a, the, the first session. The second session, uh, we took a deep dive uh, on, from the corporate perspective and how companies of any sizes uh, could look at uh, and work uh, in, in blue carbon. Why is it relevant for them, uh, for their business model uh, within the value chain? Um, and we explore why this is relevant and how they could engage uh, in terms of carbon market or other type of, of, of uh, mechanism. So if you are a, a company today in the call, really encouraging you uh, to uh, look at the, at the second webinar, where we will give you some uh, key um, um, uh, tools to, to understand uh, uh, how uh, and why blue carbon are relevant for your uh, company. Uh, and, and by the way, even if you are not working on the coast, um, it's uh, still relevant to secure, for instance, uh, your value chain, which could be uh, uh, facing uh, challenges uh, with uh, sea level rise or extreme weather event. Um, so blue carbon ecosystem can really be part of, of ensuring the long term resilience uh, of, of your uh, business model. Today, um, we are addressing a third topic, uh, which is really critical in terms of uh, ensuring the long-term sustainability and good state of blue carbon uh, ecosystem, which could be uh, seagrasses, uh, mangrove, um, uh, et cetera, which are the role of coastal communities uh, as being stewards and guardians of this uh, ecosystem. Uh, we know uh, that by not involving, and that has been proven by science and, and a lot of works in them, that by not improving, um, sorry, involving coastal communities as key players in designing and implementing um, um, blue carbon uh, conservation efforts, uh, this will never uh, be uh, a success. Um, so I will um, 
stop here because my good friend and uh, and colleague uh, Thomas Bernard who is working in Africa with coastal communities on this topic um, will give you uh, much more insight on on the role of of these communities in in uh, implementing su successful uh, coastal uh, conservation. But I just want to highlight that um, you know I think it's a great complement to the first two session uh, and it's really a top uh, an issue and a uh, network of, I mean, a group of stakeholders that have to be key uh, as you are thinking as a company or, you know, other organization with uh, at, about Blue Carbon is the involvement of um, indigenous uh, coastal communities. Um, I will just conclude by saying that um, after COP27, which, uh, you know, there is seen a lot of progress or at least discussion uh, on uh, some progress on carbon credits overall, specifically for, for Africa. We've seen some progress also on, on, on blue carbon. We are now moving to the COP15, uh, the CBD um, biodiversity uh, in Montreal, uh, where blue carbon engagement of coastal communities will be a crucial topic uh, if we want um, uh, the Global Biodiversity Framework 2020 to be uh, uh, a success. So, you know, you see that blue carbon is uh, maybe critical for your business model, mm -hmm. but it's also addressed at the highest level in global discussion at COP27, COP15, and will certainly continue to be uh, uh, a key part of the solution uh, if we want to win both the race to zero, zero emission, and the race to resilience, to build the resilience of the most vulnerable population. Um, so Aurélie, I will stop here. It's good to see all of you again. And uh, I believe, Thomas, uh, over to you. Thank you, Ignace. And uh, now, um, in this first part, uh, we will listen to Thomas for an introduction of the topic. In the second part, uh, we will uh, listen to examples of projects. So thank you to all our speakers today. And uh, now I give the floor to Thomas for the first part. And maybe Thomas, you can introduce yourself before starting. Yeah, no, wonderful. Thanks so much for, for the opportunity, for inviting me, really. It's, it's a privilege. I'm really, really happy to be here and, uh, and great to see many uh, friends on, on, on the call. Uh, some I haven't seen for quite some time and some uh, more regularly, but in any case, I think it's really, really, really a very opportune time actually to have that discussion indeed, because in yes, you've just mentioned uh, next week, well, actually, we're just about to start the, the COP15 for the, the Convention of on Biological Diversity, and it goes without saying that uh, carbon credits, and in our case, blue carbon credits, going to have to play in any scenarios a very important role in the actual implementation and the delivery of those targets in the next uh, well, seven years, because it used to be like, we used to say like the next decade, but uh, <laughs> we were already like two years or almost three years down the road. Um, and, and indeed it's an incredible opportunity because obviously, you know, there is a huge interest, but before I go there, uh, before I forget, because I've been just asked to present myself or to introduce myself. So my name is Thomas Bernard. I work for IUCN. I'm the regional head for coastal and ocean resilience. Uh, for Africa, I'm based in, in Nairobi, um, Kenya, and, um, and in particular also working very, very actively on the Great Blue Wall Initiative uh, that is sort of being, that is born in, in Africa and led by the Western Indian Ocean region, uh, and where indeed we are very much involved uh, on blue carbon, not only blue carbon credits, by the way, it's also like the, you can work on blue carbon without emitting credits. But I guess here uh, of interest is going to be like, what are we doing and how, what, what, what can we do more to scale up and, and speed up um, the emission and uh, what actually the establishment of those of those projects and the emission of those carbon credits. Maybe just be, before I before I, I go into the technicalities, I think it's uh, and and uh, here again, you know, it's to just echo what Ineas mentioned is that at least I'm going to talk here. Um, on with like keeping in mind that I'm going to um, focus on the African continent because this is where we work, this is where we are. And but I, in reality, I do believe that what I'm going to say do apply for the rest of the world. But you know, if it doesn't, please uh, just keep in mind that right now I'm, I come from a, uh, an angle that do apply for sure on the African continent. And yes, 
Um, there is no question as that there is no blue carbon credit without having blue communities. You can just forget about it. This is just not happening. The, re the reason why is because, uh, well, it's very straightforward, is because those are actually the people living in those areas and they are the best place. And in fact, not only the best place, but the only well placed to actually take care and become the stewards and what we call the, the blue guardians of those areas. Um, because indeed, you know, they literally enter into the mangrove, into the seagrass, into the ocean, literally every single day. And they can become as much of a threat, as much of a um, uh, um, guardians of those areas. You know that when we establish a blue carbon project, uh, most of them, they in particular, like uh, in our in our in our case, they have to prove additionality. Additionality means, and I'm sure by now you're all very well, uh, you know, you're all experts on on carbon credits. But it basically means that you need to prove that whatever you will be doing on the ground will stop the degradation trend and eventually revert it into a restoration trend, so that then you can basically emit credits based on avoided future emissions. And usually we try to sort of top it up with a bit of restoration, so like um, additional sequestration activities, but that's not the the, the core of, uh, at least in our region, again, it's not what composed most of the, the, the value of the carbon credits. Um, in fact, indeed, here in Kenya, we have the Mikoko Pamoja project that we've been supported of for the past 15 years, and 90% of the credits are actually emitted on avoided emission, not on additional sequestered emission. So that means that you need to conserve what's already existing in terms of mangrove. And on top of that, what you can restore, you can try to value and sort of emit credit. But most, again, most of the credit will come for, from avoided deforestation, right? Um, and that's really important because uh, as I said, usually the driver of degradation of those ecosystems, they can be very diverse. They can come from unsustainable fishing practices to, uh, uh, you know, uh, expansion of cities and many, many other type of drivers. And ultimately, once again, um, the best place stakeholders and actors on the ground are actually the local communities. And in fact, most of the countries they already have specific legal mechanism to enable and empower the, com the communities to play such a role. And that, that has been, in fact, you know, already happening for decades. You know, it's nothing new. We've been working with them in empowering them in managing, sustainably using and managing those areas for a very long time. Uh, in our case, for instance, in Kenya, um, a legal tool that has been used to actually empower the communities to actually manage those mangroves forests, for instance, is the creation of community-based organization to actually manage specific areas of mangrove forest. Um, now those to be legally recognized, that means that they also need to have like a proper management plan in place, etc. So that's what we come in, we provide this technical expertise and, and, and assistance so that they can sort of formalize the activities and the priorities that need to happen. But again, um, the ones who are actually delivering those activities are the communities. And not only are they the one delivering, but ultimately should be the one. And, you know, it's actually recognized in the, in the latest uh, high quality blue carbon principle and guidance that have been recently um, uh, uh, published earlier this year is that they they need to directly benefit from those carbon credits. And that means that they need to be constituted into a community-based organization. We need to support them in, of course, you know, um, details such as opening a bank account so that they can actually receive the funding. We also need to work with the, the government in drafting the laws that will um, that will regulate basically the repartition and, and the distribution of the funds that will come from the carbon credits, and that obviously needs to be as fair and as inclusive for the local communities as possible, uh, because ultimately, once again, um, they should be the the main recipients of the effort that is being done in conserving those areas, which is done by them for them. Uh, and so they should be the, the the key the key beneficiaries. So that means that we need to work also on on that policy level to make sure that 
we don't have cowboys arriving, signing an MOU here and there, or like contract with governments or others, and just starting, you know, to emit uh, carbon credits and just take the, the, the bigger share of the lion, as one says. <clears throat> Um, so all of this, it takes actually a lot of time, including, by the way, you know, of course, in terms of the development of the management plan and all the preparation, the work that needs to be done with the communities. It takes a lot of time because, you know, work, community work is, 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 is incredible and, and it's probably one of the most rewarding work that you can do. But it also takes a lot of time because you need to establish, you know, a relationship of trust so it does mean that uh, there is a lot of sort of um, uh, upstream investment that needs to be done for project in a specific area and indeed a specific community to get on board and ultimately uh, start emitting those type of credits, blue carbon credits. Ultimately, it also means that we need to establish specific governance and decision-making mechanism in the use of those funding uh, to make sure that they are not, you know, they, they, they are not subject to the accaparation of the elites, as one called them, and that they actually benefit the community and not just one out of all the things. So when you buy carbon credits, therefore, it's critical that, you know, you, 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 are, you are as much informed and, and as comfortable with this type of setup as possible. Now, so that's exactly what we've been working on and developing all those models, as well as the science and the methodology that we've been working on in establishing and proving as a model here in Kenya. Now, the big question is, how can we scale that up and speed that up uh, in a way that it actually will contribute substantially in the, the, the achievement of the, the CBD targets and the climate targets? Because indeed, in our case, they are intricately linked um, there is no mangrove without carbon and vice versa. There is no carbon sequestration without man blue, blue, mangrove standing. Um, and so in, in, in that particular case, that means that, um, sorry, I sort of lost my train of thoughts. <laughs> it's a bit late in the day here and I had a full day, but uh, um, mm, what I was saying, I was saying that, oh yeah, sorry, scale, uh, about the, the scaling up and speeding up. Um, it, in all transparency, as it is in the sort of those pilot projects that we've established in the in the region and in Kenya in particular, I can tell you that we spend much, much, much more funding in in setting that up than they actually and will ever contribute in terms of carbon credits value. But that's fine because at that time the whole point was to actually you know pilots and produce the methodology and 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 sort of prove that the model can work now the big question is how can we make sure that we are in a position to bring that to scale in a cost effective way and actually just so happened that i just came back from the mikokopa moja to actually discuss exactly about those points um, with some of the some of our partners there about two weeks ago and um and and it's very interesting that there is a few things that take a lot of time and resources and with which they've been struggling. And I think where we should really sort of play a role. One is, uh, well, first, you know, the production of data and accurate data and sort of on a recurring basis so that they can have access to the latest maps. Because again, if you actually want to be able to prove additionality, usually you need to prove that in time, uh, there is like historical data that shows that there has been degradation and that therefore you can assess that you will avoid a certain percentage of future degradation and therefore, you know, uh, be able to emit carbon credits. So right now for mangrove, that's what exactly what we just did now. We've uh, recently published an updated map of the entire uh, mangrove ecosystem in the Western Indian Ocean region. Uh, so this data is available, including the historical data and the, the, the sort of restoration potential on mangroves in particular. By the way, we'll do exactly the same on seagrass starting next year. So then the idea will be for us to basically combine mangrove and seagrass and sort of bundle it in a way that we would add value to a carbon credit because currently, based on the available science, we are not yet able to emit carbon credits on seagrass ecosystem alone. But what we can do, it's a bit having like a, a red plus type of approach where basically we would add 
additional conservation sort of and co-benefits activity linked to the seagrass meadow that are ecologically directly linked with uh, with the mangroves and basically add a premium on the carbon credits um, that that will be added uh, based on the mangrove sequestration or avoided sequest um, emission uh, carbon credits. Now, uh, so the, the the data is essential not only the maps by the way but also the current uh, carbon sequestered in those ecosystems because here again you need to be able not only to prove the degradation trend but you need also to give a, a very concrete uh, number on the carbon that will be avoided by the by the, fu the avoided future degradation of the biomass so that means that you need to know already what's in that biomass uh, and here again it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of ground truthing it takes it takes a lot of laboratory um, uh, work, which uh, usually, uh, unfortunately, for instance, the analysis of this type of carbon uh, uh, data is not really a possibility on the continent. So then it goes; to, it needs to go to Europe or to or to Japan or to to the US, and then you know it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money. And so right now we are considering establishing some sort of like a data bank, basically that would be established at the regional level, available for basically uh, you know uh, freely to all stakeholders, so that they at least they can have access to that. Right. Um, the other piece of the puzzle, which is also very important, is the socio-economic data. But this is much more already sort of produced. Uh, either you know by by the mini local governments or the ministries, so it's less of an issue. It takes time, but but it's less less of an issue. It's much more readily available than than those two other components, which is uh, basically the maps and and the carbon uh, data. Now, a critical thing though is that even though there is communities and there is the potential, uh, as you can imagine, most of them they actually have absolutely no clue on how to set up this type of uh, carbon credits. A mechanism. So for us, it's going to be critical to provide them with the awareness and the technical assistance to actually support uh, local NGOs and CBOs, community-based organizations, in establishing on a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, basis and methodology those type of carbon credits. And so, and also to provide them with uh, sort of seed funding to be able to establish those type of projects. So right now, what we are uh, working on is developing a blue carbon accelerator fund for the region under the Great Blue Wall Initiative to do exactly that uh, on top of you know making this critical data available to those partners um, uh, even though you know some might have access to it without uh, supporting them and that's perfectly fine that's exactly what needs to happen on top of obviously all the work that needs to be done with the government at the national and subnational level in making sure that the rules of the games are the right one and they are uh, as beneficial as possible to the local communities here again I, I just I really want to strengthen that point because uh, we've seen other example where it wasn't the case and and uh, and it's unacceptable and, and eventually if if we go down that road, it will just be a very big failure. Now, uh, and I'm, I, I'll stop here very soon. Um, I've actually sort of sit down again with sort of our partners here in Kenya on the Mikoko Pamoja and the, the Blue Vanga uh, Forest Project. And very interestingly, right now, where, where there is a huge gap still, or gap and an issue, really, a challenge, it's their capacity to trade in a fair and sort of equitable way, those carbon credits, most of the organization that are currently sort of buying credit from there, it's usually like foundation in Europe. And then uh, they sell those credits on behalf of the project holders. And what happened currently, at least as it is, they are taking 40% of the value of the credits uh, for marketing purposes and etc. Imagine want to scale that up there is absolutely no way that that uh, ratio uh, you know is is um sustainable it should be much 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 less uh, and therefore that means that we need to come up with some sort of like a marketplace where not only do we reduce by you know aggregating the carbon credits and our capacity to market them but also increase the power of the communities and those stakeholders in the, the local level 
to um, to to negotiate the best rate, the best price for the carbon credits, because currently it's completely done on an ad hoc basis. So you know, even though right now they are trading it at eighteen dollars, it doesn't mean that it's like a, a fixed car. It's a fixed uh, price. In fact, some are buying them and then reselling them for twice that price. Uh, and and that's as you can imagine, you know, this sort of game of adding more and more and more intermediaries uh, is exactly what should not be happening. Um, so not only do we need to uh, strengthen their power of negotiation, but we also need to bring them together so that they can also push and support them in pushing to increase the price that should be given actually for the carbon ton, the ton of carbon, uh, which should be much, much, much higher, in fact, than $18 if we want this to become sustainable. It will increase because as you can imagine, um, when we had started trading was blue carbon credits, that was like 15 years ago, and we were trading them at, I think, at $2 and then $3 and then $4. Now, today, we're at 18 Um Well, they are at 18 because, to be transparent, AUCN is not a trader, so we don't sell those. We only provide you know technical assistance and support them. But um, they should be at the very least around $60 a ton, if not $100 a ton. And that's usually uh, you know, a figure that is commonly referred to as a, ta a target that we should reach at the international level when we trade carbon, carbon tons of carbons. Um, yeah, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop here because I think I, I don't want to talk too much. And I think I've, I might have already talked a bit too much. But uh, super happy to have a discussion and a, and a back and forth on, on some of those points. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas, for this very interesting first part. Uh, so we will now move on the first question and answer session. Uh, you can write your questions uh, into the chat box. And Thomas, if you want, you can read questions directly in the chat box. You receive the first ones uh, in the chat box. So uh, maybe you can uh, ask uh, this one. Okay, so let me go through those. Uh, so one, the first one is from Nicholas, right, Jay-Z? Yes. Uh, is there a draft available that sums up the rules that are established to see if we can apply for such credits? You're talking about mangroves. You guys, is there something about whales, tunas, for instance? <laughs> yeah, I. That's actually sort of my next, my next sort of uh, uh, um, pet project, which I'd love actually for us to be able to start looking into that. But no, uh, the clear and short uh, response to that is that no, there is nothing on whales and tuna yet, even though indeed. Uh, a few very, very interesting and insightful studies on the, the carbon sequestration uh, capacities of whales and tunas, etc. But as you can imagine, to prove, you know, and be able to sell carbon credits based on, you know, whales and tunas and other actually um, uh, marine biomass uh, or fishery, you know, uh, other type of fisheries, for instance, it's going to be quite a challenge. I don't think it's completely impossible. Uh, actually, I, I think there is ways uh, that we could do it, but uh, but we're not yet there, and I don't think um, we'll be there in, in the next few years. Uh, but uh, but I think there's definitely something that we should really sort of consider uh, much 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 more in terms of research and developing the methodology and, and everything, uh, which to me would be absolutely terrific. But uh, on on the sort of the rules, yes, there is actually. Um, this, uh, the principles, at least there is principles that have been uh, they're published currently to make sure that there is the blue carbon credits are, are of high quality. I think it's a very good place to start to really understand what are the key sort of things to consider when you actually go down the road of, of, uh, of developing a carbon credit project. Uh, but again, once you have that, it's a roadmap a bit. Uh, but it will very much differ on, you know, the 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 current, the 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 basically the local context. You know, is there already like, for instance, a CBO? Is there already a community? Is there already a beach management unit? Who's, for instance, claiming uh, the mandate over mangrove forests? Because believe it or not, but uh, it the law can say very different things depending on who you talk to. So, for instance, if you talk to fisheries. Many will say, well, actually, the mandate of the Ministry of Fisheries go up to the high tide mark, which means also include the mangroves. But the mangrove, and usually the mangrove are considered forest. So if you're in charge of forest, 
usually then they say their mandate is down to the low tide mark. So that means also, therefore, that they should have actually the mandates on, on mangrove. And by the way, that also extends on seagrass. And it might sound like a technicality, but it's very important because depending on who you talk to, you will have different um, local community-based governance type of bodies that will have to be established to empower those communities to actually have the right to manage those areas and therefore emit credits on those areas. Otherwise, nobody can do it. And that, for instance, if you talk to the Ministry of uh, Forestry, they will say mangroves are forests, so therefore it's on our mandate. And then you should, as a first, very first step, work with the community to establish a community forest association, which then will be the recipient of the carbon credits, open you know, a, a bank account to receive the, pro the proceeding of those carbon credits. But if you start that same process with the Ministry of Fisheries, they will say, no, 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 what you need to do is to actually establish a beach, a beach management unit, because that depend, that is the local sort of community-based governance body that depends on the Ministry of Fisheries. And that will be the body that should be uh, sort of mandated and empowered to manage the, the, the mangroves and the seagrass. And in fact, yeah, sort of nobody really agrees, so it's a bit of a headache, but, um, but that's the to deal with as well and clarify and make sure that sort of it's it's set for purpose and of course us IUCN our role is also to work more at the national level to actually also as I say clarify the rules of the games including these type of rules which you know is critical in particular now for instance I just say that we are looking into bundling uh, mangroves and seagrass ecosystems for now most in most of the cases seagrass were actually managed by BMUs, beach management units, which are basically local, you know, community-based organizations that manage the piece of the ocean. But now you can imagine that if the BMUs are the one managing the seagrass and the community forest association are the one managing the mangroves, so who actually end up benefiting from a bundle, you know, carbon credit with mangrove and seagrass. So those type of things, you know, again, it will depend on, on, on the very local context and actually sitting one with the communities, the government, the local authorities in clarifying those rules and making sure that everybody is on the same page. So, yeah, there is a roadmap, uh, but, but there is no really like a detailed sort of things uh, because, again, it will very much depend on, on the context. So that's for you, Nicolas. Uh, Timothy, you say... Very interesting, thank you. Where and when can these historical and current maps of mangrove in East Africa you were mentioning be found, please, if they are in open access and already available? Yes, they are, and we've uploaded all of them uh, on a free access, completely free access on the Global Mangrove Watch. So right now, if you're actually logging into Global Mangrove Watch, you will find uh, all the latest data and maps available for Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, and Madagascar, which are basically the four countries that we've covered with uh, our Save Our Mangrove Now project, and uh, which for which we've actually mapped out the, the this ecosystem. By the way, we also have provided, uh, we also have produced what we call socioeconomic profiles that could also help you, you know, in terms of the the, the sort of socioeconomic data uh, um, that are also freely available and are actually also available uh, and freely, free, free to access on our website as well as I, I think on the Save Our Mangrove Now page of the Global Mangrove Alliance, which we are co-chairing as well. Um, so I uh, encourage you to, to, to go on those websites to have access uh, to those data. And again, we'll do the exact same thing for Seagrass starting next year. And so that will also be available. Um, now, on on mangrove, on, on, sorry, on carbon um, carbon sequestration and sort of uh, data in particular. Unfortunately, we don't have that yet available, and that's something I'm hoping that we'll be able to secure uh, funding, basically, to to support the the region and the countries in producing that type of data. Um, Thank you, Thomas. Um, maybe uh, now we will move on the second part of our webinar. And thank you for your presentation. And uh, I let the floor to Anne-Sophie from uh, Tenaka for the first uh, exam example. 
Thank you, Aurélie, and hi to everyone. Uh, thank you as well for the invitation. I'm very uh, happy to be here with you all. Um, so to present do myself you very have, briefly... Uh, and Sophie, do you have a presentation to share? No, I don't. Okay, okay. So yeah, to present myself very briefly, I'm the founder of Tenaka, which is a social business on a mission to regenerate the ocean. And I am also the representative for France uh, at the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Um, and to give a bit of background on my uh, background, um, I've been uh, researching uh, at Sciences Po in Paris about um, the adaptation of coastal communities to the climate crisis. So all the things that we are discussing here are very much what I was researching about uh, during my studies and my time uh, in, um, in Sciences Po. Uh, and I had the uh, opportunity to lead a research project on the front lines of the climate crisis to really investigate what um, what types of solutions local communities take to adapt themselves to the consequences of global warming uh, and restoration and preservation of coastal habitats and blue carbon habitats was very much one of the biggest ones. Uh, and that's also a reason why I wanted to launch uh, Tenaka. Um, and one of the key findings that I had during this research was really that um, bringing the ownership for local communities for this type of project is not only critical, it's the key enabling condition for the success of the project on the long run. Like a top-down approach for this kind of projects simply doesn't work on the long run. Um, so it is very, very important as well to engage with all sectors of local communities, like local uh, businesses, NGOs, scientists, uh, women, uh, schools, younger generations, uh, local governmental branches, etc., uh, for it to be a success as well. And one of the reasons why I created Tenaka as well was that on the field, uh, so in Southeast Asia, for example, or in the Pacific Islands, one of the um, big limiting, limiting factor that I found for a uh, blue carbon project was the lack of perennial sources of funding. Like most of them rely on like, for instance, uh, governmental funding, which are highly dependent on the political calendar. And that only lasts a few years before you have to start all over again to find new money from another uh, government or from another philanthropist philanthropic organization, for instance. Um, and my goal by creating Tenaka was really to bring a solution to this problem uh, and to bring local communities a perennial source of funding. And so the way we work at Tenaka is basically we provide um, pluriannual programs for companies to invest in the regeneration and the preservation of coastal habitats. So we have a program dedicated um, to coral reefs, which are not considered as blue carbon ecosystems, but they are very important for biodiversity, for instance. And another program that is focused on mangroves, which you can see behind me, uh, which are effectively um, amazing uh, things for uh, carbon. And to give you uh, uh, an idea, in, uh, in most places of the world, mangroves forests can sequester up to in average, five times more carbon than a terrestrial forest per unit area, and in some parts of the world up to 10 times uh, the carbon that is sequestered by a terrestrial forest. So the impacts are really, really important. Um, and the um, community-based approach is very much at the center of what we do at Tenaka. So we always start with local communities, from local communities and for local communities. Um, and that's really want something that is, I think, a key enabling uh, condition for any blue carbon project. Um, and then another um, thing that I think is important to have in mind, especially when we work with companies such as us at uh, Tenaka, um, is the necessity to have a holistic approach when we talk about blue carbon credits, for instance, or blue carbon projects um, as a whole, because mangroves are worth 55,000 of US dollars per year and per hectare. And that includes all the co-benefits that they provide for local communities. And that's from fish stocks to jobs creation, to livelihood, to coastal protection. So we have a huge range of impacts 
that goes from biodiversity to carbon and to socioeconomic impacts. So I think when talking to companies, it is absolutely um, a critical necessity to have this um, to think blue carbon beyond carbon, because carbon is not only the main piece of the puzzle here. Um, and I think the one of the issues that I see, especially with, again, talking with companies, is that blue carbon credits can lead many companies to think that compensating in the solution, uh, and whereas all the IPCC reports are very uh, aligned on the fact that the absolute priority is to reduce greenhouse gases emissions at the first place. Um, so that's why I was very aligned with uh, what uh, Thomas was saying in uh, his introduction about the priority given to avoided emission, I think is very, very much central, uh, and especially for companies, because carbon credits are at the center of any company strategy to be uh, net zero or sustainable or whatever their strategy is. So, and the other um, challenge that I see with uh, blue carbon uh, credits, especially with local uh, communities is that we need as well to, to sustain um, small scale projects because when talking about blue carbon credits, the volumes of CO2, of tons of CO2 to be compensated are so big that you need to have like thousands and thousands of hectares available to restore in order to fill that amount of CO2. And that excludes de facto many uh, small scale projects, which are equally important to be sustained and to be restored. Um, and so Miko Kopamoja to me is the absolute perfect example of the success uh, of a successful community first blue carbon credit project. And I'm so, so admir admirative about the work uh, that they do there. It's absolutely amazing. Um, but I think it's important as well to sustain all the projects that don't fit into the, categor the categories of blue carbon uh, credit schemes. Um, and for example, to, to, to give an, an example, because we are starting some um, new projects in the Caribbean um, uh, area. For now, we are mainly based in Southeast Asia and also in the Indian Ocean. And the next step for us in 2023 is to open new regeneration sites in the Caribbean. Um, and over there, uh, Caribbean islands were really devastated by a huge hurricane, which was called Irma uh, in 2017. And over there, all the mangroves that were existing were devastated by the hurricane. But if the mangroves weren't there, all the coastal villages would be much more destroyed than they were. Um, so for this kind of example, I think it's important to show companies when uh, explaining a blue carbon project that we are talking about human lives. We are not only talking about like carbon credits and stuff. So that's why for me, it's very important to have this kind of holistic approach. And um, a way that we um, do that at Tenaka is through our impact measurement uh, process. So we basically have teams of marine biologists uh, on the field that restore the ecosystem and that uh, follow and monitor scientifically uh, the impacts on the long run. Um, so for mangrove forest, it's a quarterly impact measurement process that we have. And this um, basically turns for our companies and our clients into impact reporting that they can download and that they can share and use for their extra financial reporting and stuff like that. And uh, we have different sets of KPIs, especially for mangrove uh, restoration projects. So we have one about blue carbon, obviously, uh, to evaluate uh, the rates of uh, greenhouse gases that are sequestered by the project over time and on which time scale. Uh, but we also have other KPIs focusing on biodiversity because mangroves are also like nurseries for fish and for many terrestrial species as well. And they are fantastic um, uh, epicenters of biodiversity and uh, they also protect fish stocks and uh, endangered species and stuff like that. So we have the, these two main KPIs, and we also have another one on socioeconomic impacts, which is also very um, important because it basically helps us to assess the impacts for local communities. So in terms of uh, coastal protection, of jobs created, whether it's direct jobs or indirect jobs, 
um, because in the places where we work, uh, like most, uh, like 80% of the revenues are either from fisheries or from tourism. And these two economic factors are highly dependent on the good health of coastal ecosystems and especially blue carbon and mangroves um, ecosystems. So um, yeah, to, to, to conclude, I think having this community first approach in and the long-term commitment for uh, local communities is like the key enabling condition for the success of the project. Um, and that we need to have a holistic approach, not only at the micro scale, at the very local scale with local communities, uh, working with all different branches of local communities, from women to younger generation to governments and businesses, etc. But also a holistic approach in terms of uh, blue carbon credits and the idea to think blue carbon beyond uh, the only question of carbon. So, so yeah, and also for a quick note, if some of you are going to COP15, I will be there uh, talking about uh, Blue Carbon as well on several panels. So let me know if you are going there so that we can uh, catch up and, um, and see you there. Thank you all for your uh, attention. Thank you, Anne-Sophie. Uh, now um, we move on the presentation of uh, Marine. Uh, Marine, you do you have a presentation to share with us? Uh, thank you uh, for your different presentations and thanks for the invitation. Um, so my name is Marine. I am the Blue Carbon Project Manager at La Rochelle Agglomeration Community. And I am going to present to you how our territory has seized the Blue Carbon Challenge through our project La Rochelle Zero Carbon Territory. Uh, so La Rochelle Agglomeration is an agglomeration community located in the west. It is a coastal territory of uh, 327 square kilometers with 70 kilometers of coastline, 170,000 inhabitants and 28 municipalities. Um, in 2019, we, we were awarded of the Call for Projects program of investment for the future for the action territories of innovation. Thanks to our project La Rochelle Zero Carbon Territory, which aims to achieve carbon neutrality by uh, 2040. Uh, the calculation of the territory's carbon budget showed that in 2019, emissions uh, reached 2 million tons of CO2 per year. The objective of the project is to reduce this emission by 75% to 500,000 tons of CO2 per year and to sequester the rest via blue carbon, among others. Uh, to achieve this result, 10 axes of action have been set up in the project on building, energy, soft mobility, industries, etc. And the blue carbon is part of one of the axes of the project. The main objectives of the Blue Carbon Axis are to recognize the value of wetlands, to preserve the quality of these environments, and to improve their management, and finally to, to promote innovations. Uh, for this, uh, we will work on several aspects, the study of carbon capture and sequestration in aquatic environments, the role of this environment in coastal protection, the development of decision support tools to help the territory, the awareness of the blue carbon concept and the replication of our actions in other territories. The calculation of the carbon footprint of our aquatic environment is made by taking into, a, into account all the compartments of the aquatic environment, the capture of CO2 during atmospheric exchanges, benthic flows, trophic flows, the horizontal transport of this carbon from the marsh to the ocean, the carbon sequestration in soils and sediments, and the impact of some ma management methods such as dredging. Uh, it is a scientific work carried out on different study sites, as you can see on the map, with each study site being associated with a typology of aquatic environments. Uh, the work we are doing at the agglomeration community is to understand the territory in order to provide territorial data. I have to identify and map the different aquatic environments, then classify them into different typologies. On La Rochelle agglomeration, we have freshwater agricultural wetlands, 
We have salted and brackish marshes, salt meadows, mud flats, ocean. I have to understand the different management, me management methods of these environments and to work on the governance of aquatic environments with managers. This is a work in close relation with scientists. For the moment, the carbon sequestration figures found in the bibliography are not precise enough. The scientific studies conducted in this project will allow us to give a carbon sequestration value for each of these typologies. And thanks to the territorial work we have done, we will be able to associate this value to each aquatic environment present on our territory and finally give a carbon sequestration value to the territory. As a coastal territory, we are interested in the protection of our coasts against marine submersion. We have therefore integrated this topic into the blue carbon axis. Studies are being conducted on the wave dissipation potential of salt meadow and seagrass vegetation. And other studies are looking at innovative concepts of calcomagnesian deposits for coastal erosion reinforcement from natural elements present in the sea. Decision support tools specific to blue carbon are also produced. Scientific models will be created to simulate the functioning and evolution of blue carbon systems and to help the territory in its political and territorial decision making. The agglomeration of La Rochelle is also in the process of creating a blue carbon platform that aims to locate the different typologies of ecosystems to integrate the data concerning them such salinity activities or habitats for example and to be able to observe which aquatic environment is a sink or a source of carbon by mapping it in red when it's a source and in green when it's a sink this platform could be used by planners environmental managers or blue carbon managers to know the carbon value of a natural area to assist in the implementation of territorial action plans or to follow the evolution of blue carbon on the territory as the blue carbon potential of the territory uh, or the state of degradation of the aquatic environment. Awareness raising actions on blue carbon are also carried out. Training for elected officials, technicians, associative volunteers, etc. Nature outings on blue carbon and interventions in schools integration of the blue carbon concept during March visits, and the creation of a blue carbon exhibition, which is itinerant and can be borrowed on request. Uh, the goal is to be able to replicate all our actions on the national and international territory. Uh, finally, I wanted to present to you uh, an example of concrete action carried out on our territory by the city of La Rochelle. Uh, between uh, 2019 and 2021, uh, the city of La Rochelle has carried out uh, work to renaturalize the Tadon March. Uh, this is a project covering 84 hectares with the creation of 10 hectares of new wetlands, the restoration of 2.5 kilometers of river, the recognition of the march with the ocean, and the work on the water cycle management in the march. Uh, the first and foremost objective of the project was biodiversity. Uh, however, the carbon issue was also part of the project studies. CO2 fluxes were measured uh, before the project in 2019 and after the project in 2021. These initial results show a change in CO2 fluxes. Uh, before the project, the March was emitting carbon and was therefore a source of carbon. And after the project, we can see that the carbon fluxes are negative or close to zero. So the March is carbon neutral uh, or a carbon sink. Uh, as a conclusion, I wanted to present to you the perspectives of action that we will carry out uh, on our territory. Uh, firstly, preserve and conserve the surfaces of our coastal aquatic environments. These are highly endangered habitats that are subject to great anthropic pressure. Uh, not destroying this environment is already acting in favor of blue carbon. Uh, secondly, act for the maintenance of the good ecological state of the ecosystems and restore the environment in bad ecological state. 
uh, only an ecosystem in good ecological condition can sequester carbon. An ecosystem in poor ecological condition will sequester less carbon and will even emit carbon. Uh, lastly, depending on the result of the various research projects carried out in our territory, we will be able to produce management recommendations to promote carbon sequestration in the environment uh, without forgetting that carbon sequestration is not the only function of a natural environment. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Marine. Um, we will uh, not now move on to the last presentation of uh, Jospat. Jospat, thank you to be with us today. Uh, you can start your presentation uh, when you want. Hello, hello everyone. So my, my name is Jospat Kashoki. I work at Kenya Marine and Fishery Research Institute. It's a government agency mandated to carry out research in the marine ecosystem and also advise the government on the, how to utilize the, the ecosystem or the resources, as well as the community giving advice to the community on how well or sustainable how to use the, the ecosystem. So uh, I will maybe pick up from where Thomas left uh, about the, the different carbon projects. Uh, so uh, we have the Mikoko Pamoja and we have the Vanga Blue Forest. All of them are settled within the mangrove ecosystem. And then there was a talk uh, by Thomas about the bundling of seagrass into the mangrove carbon uh, project. So currently my work is on the now estimate, estimating the market value of the seagrass carbon. So I think Thomas, that's the, the, the project he was talking about because it, uh, it, it consists of different partners who are trying to... Uh, see if we can have a uh, seagrass uh, being included in the mangrove uh, carbon offset uh, pro project. So that's what uh, I'm currently working on with a community. So uh, the approach we are using for this is uh, we realize that uh, for, it, or for, the, for this project to work, we need to get the community to own this project. For the community to own this project, then we need to train them or we need to get them understand the, all the concepts from the ground up to there the top level uh, into carbon uh, marketing. So currently what we're doing uh, is that we're trying to uh, train the communities, especially um, those who are in the fisheries department. So in the talk by Thomas, he was talking about the differences between the, the group which is in charge of the seagrass and the group which is in charge of the, the mangrove or the forest. So there is, we realize there is that difference. So when we're talking about the mangrove forest, most of the time we are talking about communities uh, or the, the organization of the com community forest association. When we're talking about seagrass, because it's in the jurisdiction of the, the fishery department, then we have to involve the beach management unit. So for this uh, project, we've uh, we've dwelt with the, the beach management unit, the people who are registered under the beach management unit. But the funny part is that these people, so long, because they come from the same uh, village, so you can you always find some registered in the community forest association and others registered in the beach management unit. So sometimes they crisscross, but then depending on the the, the 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 ecosystem you are talking about, you always find some small differences or the, the a, a conflict between the two organizations. So one is always pulling to the mangrove and they want to also get involved into the in the seagrass. Then on the other side, the ones who are involved in the seagrass, they want to get involved in that. So we're trying to bring, uh, bridge that gap uh, to this community in Banga. So we're trying to train both of these communities, the CFAs and the BMU, on the importance of this uh, coastal ecosystem and the connectivity of this uh, coastal ecosystem. At the same time, we're trying to train them on the skills needed to monitor this ecosystem. Remember, once this project uh, kicks off, the mandate is to the community to take care of this uh, 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 project area. So how, what the skill they need to do this? One is uh, to know what to monitor, how to monitor this ecosystem. So what we're doing currently, uh, much as we're pursuing the, uh, the bundling of secrets into the blue carbon ecosystem, is training the community on the skills, how to snorkel within the seagrass area, how to estimate the biomass, 
the above bi biomass, the below ground biomass, how to identify the, the organisms within this ecosystem, and then maybe getting the baseline of the, the, the project area. So once we have this data, we share, we uh, work out with them, and then we are able to get a baseline. And then from this, this was the, we use as our, our record to show if we have to bundle the seagrass into the mangrove ecosystem, what was the, the status before the area was uh, set aside for carbon offset projects. And then we track over time uh, the, the conditions, if the conditions are changing or the conditions still remain there, the same. So this is the work we would, uh, we trying to train them, the community on this. So uh, Thomas said he was in Mikoko Pamoja two weeks ago. I think you didn't meet me in the office, Gazi, Thomas. Uh, I think maybe by then I was in Vanga trying to work out with the community on the next step on how to train uh, other communities. So we have like, uh, we've trained like six uh, carbon assessors, that's what we're calling them. But then we realized that the six carbon assessors are not good, uh, enough to cover the whole area. So what we're trying to do is now trying to create awareness. Out of the six carbon assessors, we want to create awareness to the bigger community for them to understand what's going on in our uh, 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 estimates or what's going on in the prospect of including seagrass into the mangrove area. Remember when we say including this ecosystem, it means at some point we we'll need to do some closures into this seagrass area. So the people who do the fishing in this area, will they agree with what we want to do? So we have, we now going into the bit of consultation with the bigger community to, to see if they agree with the idea that we can use the seagrass into um, uh, uh, to create a blue carbon ecosystem so that at least also the, the BH management unit uh, group can also benefit from these credits because to, uh, to, uh, to bridge the, the conflict between the BMU and CFA, we want to have a uh, beach management unit can also uh, brag that they have they are able also to do uh, a carbon project within their seagrass area and CFA are able to do that. But then we need also to make a connection between the two because like Thomas has said before, it's quite difficult to sell the seagrass carbon on its own. So what we're doing is we're trying to see, is it possible to match, first of all, to match this group two groups to agree that they can work together and then they can implement a blue carbon project cutting across between mangrove and the and the seagrass uh, ecosystem. So those are some of the things or the current projects uh, we're trying to uh, imp, uh, work on. And we are hoping maybe by mid-2023, we could have the first seagrass uh, carbon project uh, registered now into the maybe the blue carbon market uh, 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 platforms. So that's the current project I'm working on. And also, I think we've talked with uh, Sophie quite a number of times trying to brainstorm on what the, the policies or what are the legal acts that's required to have this uh, blue carbon uh, ecosystem. We realize that although it's a good uh, venture, but different uh, countries or different communities have different views of the same. So we we are talking about what's what are the drawbacks or what's what's pulling down some of the communities because uh, the blue carbon uh, project is a new idea to many of the of the community and also also uh, Thomas, I think you agree with me. Not all of the scientists understand the whole concept of the blue carbon ecosystem. So right now, we're trying also to make it as um, understandable to the biggest uh, science community as possible, so that at least once we say we want to implement a project, we can have a, a bigger support for both the political uh, uh, group and also the, the scientific group, at, so that at least we are able to move together and see how we could... Uh, 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 conserve uh, the, the of the blue carbon ecosystem. Like uh, Marie was saying, is not just looking at what we're looking at the blue carbon uh, credits. What's the bigger picture? So if I conserve this area, apart from getting the benefit from the carbon credits, what other benefit am I getting? Can I do, can I restore back the biodiversity in this ecosystem? So those are now the, the aspects we're trying also to uh, diverse in our, in our discussion with the different political uh, groups and also the community so that at least we have a, a diverse uh, um, uh, impact or influence into the, into the conservation. So uh, in our work, we're dealing with different partners. So uh, we have the IUCN with us, we have UNEP 
we have WWF, we have uh, different people who are trying to chip in and also trying to work in different parts of the, the coastline, especially on the Kenyan coastline. Different partners are trying to uh, see how they could improve the conservation of this ecosystem. So maybe, uh, Thomas, what I was thinking, you raised a, a concern about maybe trying to uh, do the negotiation at the global market. So what I'm thinking uh, currently, what we're doing is uh, as a community, most of the community don't have the capacity maybe to negotiate at the global uh, platform. So maybe what I would ask, ask from your side, Thomas, is that we need to think about how we could um, uh, create capacity for the community and also try to bring them on these uh, uh, international platforms uh, where we going about the uh, carbon uh, trading so that at least they could be exposed to this uh, platform and then they could also play part in maybe doing the, the negotiation. That way there will be transparency and then they won't have these uh, drawbacks or these um, uh, con uh, hidebacks whereby people are uh, saying, oh, we, are, we sold our carbon at this rate but we are told it's sold at a higher, a higher rate. So then if the community can be able to come to this platform and also maybe voice their, uh, their concerns, maybe we could try to make the whole process more transparent and more acceptable to the, to the bigger community. Yeah, uh, maybe, uh, the, uh, maybe before I finish, I would maybe uh, let you know that uh, last week, I think on 23rd, we had a huge visit uh, or a big visit from the Prince of uh, Norway and also the Princess of Sweden just to come and visit the Mikoko uh, uh, Pamoja project. So I think this, uh, like uh, Sophie has said, and Thomas has also insisted, it's a project that is on a global map and people are emulating how it's being done and how we could upscale this to the bigger community and also maybe see how each and every community or the government can benefit by just conserving the ecosystem and then doing uh, the necessary to reduce the climate change and also benefit the biodiversity and also the livelihood of the people living adjacent to this ecosystem. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jospat. Um, we are now at the end of the presentations. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Um, there is no questions in the chat box, so maybe uh, I can ask a question myself. So uh, it's a question for everyone. Uh, how to measure the impact of the project? And Sophie, maybe you can... Uh, answer the question first? Yeah, definitely with pleasure. Um, so yeah, for me, the blue carbon project as a whole is highly dependent on data and uh, having um, this data is definitely uh, the one of the most important uh, ways um, as, to ensure the, the long-term success of the project, but also to uh, evaluate the impact, basically. Um, and one of the challenges that I see in terms of measuring the impacts, especially on the blue carbon uh, side of the impacts, is uh, this um, lack of data. Some uh, Sometimes in a different part of the world, we don't have the data on how much uh, does this mangrove forest uh, sequesters. Um, and that's kind of a challenge that, um, that that needs to be addressed. And I know the IUCN is highly, uh, highly um, working on that and the mangrove, uh, the global mangrove watch as well. So uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, that will be solved, I think, in the next uh, few years, because the, 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 the question of data regarding blue carbon is very much uh, an actual question and is it's um it's uh yeah it's an evolving world uh and so i'm sure it will be um solved soon um the way we do it uh so regarding the different kpis um firstly on the blue carbon uh impacts we are working in an area in so in borneo malaysia which you can see behind me uh, which is very very well studied um and the mangroves there are uh, yeah, the literature is very abundant about these types of mangroves. And so we have this chance to know very precisely at a very uh, local scale how much this forest sequestered and the timeline, etc. So that's kind of easy because we started in this area, which is very well studied, um, but it might not work for other parts of the world. Um, 
And there are some areas, for instance, in the Caribbean, some islands where we want to start a uh, blue carbon uh, project, but the data isn't there yet. So we firstly have to start all over again and to fund uh, the, research, the research and development uh, phase, basically, of the project to do the calculations. So um, it's a and uh, sent to laboratories to know how much uh, carbon and greenhouse gases are sequestered and stuff like that. Um, and then on the biodiversity um, impacts, uh, the sent uh, manual. So our marine biologists basically go on the field every quarter to measure all the biodiversity that they see uh, regarding different sets, of course, of um, like the abundance of species, the diversity of species, uh, the keystone species, the endangered species, etc. Uh, and that's something that we are very much looking into for uh, the next years is environmental DNA. I don't know if you are all familiar with this. I wasn't six months ago. <laughs> so really, I just uh, discovered this. But it's basically the idea of um, collecting soil samplings or water samplings in, uh, in case you are underwater uh, and to extract all the DNA that is present in the ecosystems because Oh, every species, even us humans, we leave a part, a tiny part of our DNA when we go into an environment. And that's a very important um, uh, tool for us because it's basically helped us to have a very concrete idea and a before after comparison of our impact in terms of biodiversity. So that's, um, that's really the next level uh, tool for us to measure biodiversity. So that's something we are working on uh, for 2023 and the years to come. And then lastly, for the socioeconomic impacts, um, that's something that I've worked on during my uh, studies, uh, my research uh, as well. Uh, and for this kind of data, I think it's more a qualitative data rather than quantitative for the two first KPIs on blue carbon and biodiversity. And so the idea would be really to have like a big form uh, of questions to ask to all different groups of uh, civil society and local communities in order to assess um, the impacts uh, on like jobs creation, uh, indirect or direct jobs, um, food security, coastal protection, cultural aspects as well, because mangroves are very much a big part of local cultures in uh, many parts of the world. Um, so yeah, for the last part, it's more, I think, a qualitative uh, approach to lead uh, and a quantitative for blue carbon and biodiversity. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Anne-Sophie. Uh, Marine, uh, Jospad, do you want to, to answer quickly the question? Uh, yes, uh, you can go. No, j'y vais. Um, par contre, je vais répondre en français du coup. Um, nous, au niveau du, du projet, pour euh, mesurer son impact, on va, enfin, il y a donc euh, deux, deux différences. Enfin, on va différencier euh, l'impact euh, sur la biodiversité de celui sur la population. Pour suivre l'impact sur la biodiversité, on a vraiment développé euh, du coup cette, plaf cette plateforme Carbone Bleu, qui va permettre de suivre euh, euh, les différents milieux. Euh, s'ils sont des puits ou des sources de carbone au début du projet et à la fin du projet et tout au long de la suite euh, en fait, de l'évolution du territoire. Euh, et on va pouvoir voir aussi euh, leur état euh, écologique, s'ils sont passés de mauvais état à un bon état, euh, avec euh, différents indicateurs de, de suivi. Euh, et au niveau euh, de la population, euh, on, va, on a des indicateurs de suivi sur la sensibilisation qu'on peut faire euh, sur le territoire, euh, par exemple le nombre de classes scolaires qui ont été sensibilisées, le nombre de personnes qui se sont rendues à nos formations. Euh, et on a également euh, réalisé avec euh, nos partenaires euh, un questionnaire en fait, euh, qui a été fait euh, au début du projet pour savoir euh, si les personnes euh, connaissaient ce qu'était le carbone bleu et euh, s'ils pouvaient l'expliquer. Et euh, ce questionnaire sera refait projet euh, sur la population euh, du territoire euh, pour savoir s'il y a eu une évolution en fait dans la connaissance du carbone bleu et du sujet. Et donc ce, il y aura un stage sur, sur ça pour voir en fait la sensibilisation de la population avant et après le projet. 
Thank you, Marine. Uh, Jospan, do you want to answer quick, quickly uh, to the question? Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe some, some of the impacts uh, the project have, one would be like opening up an area to a global uh, platform. Like the Mikoko Pamoja has created like a platform whereby everybody in the world knows what's the Blue Carbon project. So that's one we could always say by having a project, a successful project within a community, it opens up that community to a global uh, area platform and people uh, frequent that area. So we're having a lot of uh, people who want to come and learn in that ecosystem. What is it that they did to be able to be successful in such a, a project? Another one is uh, we're seeing that a lot of now community within this uh, area, the Vanga and Gazi, they can, even if you don't have a technical person to explain to the visitor what's going on. We have community who are now well versed in this ecosystem or this project and they can be able to explain to the, to the, to the visitors what's uh, happening because of this project and the, the way they're being uh, portrayed in the international uh, platform or national platform has created an, a, a great awareness or capacity within this ecosystem, uh, within these uh, communities and they are able now to, to fend on why they are doing the conservation in those ecosystems. Again, also within this uh, project, they are able to improve the livelihood of this community. Like we have quite a number of uh, a shortage of, of fresh water within the, the, the Gazi community. But since the, uh, the project came into being in 2013, we've, uh, the community have been able to pipe fresh water within the, the, the community. Also maybe into the education aspect, they are able to buy more books uh, to, to supplement what the government gives. And then they are moving towards now also uh, supplying, uh, giving supply to the local pharmacy. So I think to the community, there is a, a very good thing that they could always uh, uh, um, say that they've been able to improve their livelihood as well as the, the bigger community. They are able to, to see the benefit of such a project within the, the area. Thank you. And we are almost at the end of uh, this session. Uh, we have to stop here the question session. And, but Thomas, uh, do you want to say a conclusion word or react? No, no. Um, th thanks so much for 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 the. It was super interesting to hear this project. I I um I can only you know uh, greatly congratulate all the. The incredible work, really, that is currently being done, you know, in France, in Africa, and elsewhere around the world. Uh, I'm, you know, because ultimately the, those are our northern stars, right? They are the ones who are actually guiding uh, the entire world to trying to sort of really unlock the potential of of those type of financial mechanisms, and of course of blue carbon, as you as you've mentioned, just that. In fact, I was actually. Uh, in Vanga just the day after that the two princesses were there. So for some reason, I don't understand, there was much less people there when we arrived and when the two princesses were there, I'm sure. So that's probably why we didn't meet. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, um, I, I uh, it's really, really, really inspiring, you know, everything that is being done. Not the, my, my biggest sort of worry is that is there a way and we will be able to actually scale that up and speed that up in time for us to achieve the 2030 targets? Science is very clear. We need to be able to meet those targets in time uh, to stay below the 1.5, even though right now um, there is some increase in skepticism uh, internationally in our actual capacity to stay below the 1.5. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's we still continue fighting as well and of course you know reversing and uh, the the biodiversity loss trend now just on on some of the few points i think uh, in particular the the work being done in la rochelle for for me that's really and very much in line sort of the thinking that we have in terms of next level and more like broadening the scope at the landscape uh, at, the, at the landscape level in our case we call those seascapes because we are blue people <laughs> so we talk about seascapes and really sort of trying to have um, these combined efforts and include you know more and more blue ecosystems which indeed you know as Joseph had mentioned the first step in the in the in the Vanga area is actually to start bundling into uh, those carbon uh, credits the seascape, but in fact, we should not stop there because you know the the biology and the ecology is very clear that uh, those ecosystems are directly linked. They are interlinked. They are interdependent, including corals, for instance. Even though the coral 
reef itself might not be necessarily a big sequester of carbon. They are a huge uh, and a very important ecosystem when it comes to uh, keeping healthy um, um, seagrass and, and mangroves, as well as, by the way, coastal forest and you know salt marsh. So all of this, in fact, is one big ecosystem. We divided it from a scientific point of view, but the truth is uh, they are not really divided at all. They are really interconnected and we should ultimately aim at, aim at doing that. And indeed, not only valuing their carbon value, but also their biodiversity and socioeconomic impacts uh, that they are having, which are really incredible. When I was actually uh, there in Vanga, I was absolutely blown away about the level of awareness and championship shown uh, and showcased by by communities and i swear to god we actually sat down for more than an hour with them asking very technical questions and they were like the masters in the room i was like wow <laughs> this is you know this is happening so that's you know and we should not really undervalue this the impact of this type of work which again has been here led by our friends at Camfree, which it's absolutely you know incredible what they are doing and there is no you know no no there is a reason why the entire world is actually coming and looking at what they've done it's because it's really stellar and so please come in uh, i i'm sure just that will be happy to show you around <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and help us sort of spread the, the world in Kenya, in the region, and, and around the world. And IUCN is here for to facilitate this type of process. So thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, it's now the end of our webinar. Uh, so thank you again to all our speakers. And thank you for participating uh, in, this, uh, in this third and last sessions. And uh, we wish you a very good end of day and a happy end of year two.